In the days when the Asgardians still watched from the shadows, humanity increasingly fell into discord and greed. Mocking verses tore apart communities, and many powerful men were constantly striving to outdo their neighbors in everything, whether it was with faster horses, sharper weapons, grander buildings, or more desirable women. Feasts became louder and more extravagant due to selfishness and insatiable greed for gold. One man tried to outshine another by serving even finer dishes and showering his guests with even more lavish gifts. However, this abundance also led to waste. Trash was ruthlessly thrown into rivers and lakes, causing the water to stink and rot. Amidst this negligence, people forgot an ancient duty of the community, to trim the nails of their deceased. From these neglected nails grew Nagalfar, the death ship, a dark omen that prophesied that one day this ship would carry the world's enemies who would march against the Asgardians in war. Due to the growing carelessness of humans, the completion of Nagalfar was approaching rapidly. This age of negligence also emboldened the enemies of Midgard. The frost giants became bolder and hurled hailstones the size of eggs against the land. The dreaded Midgard serpent rose more frequently from the depths of the sea, poisoning the air with its breath and spreading fear and terror. Even Yggdrasil, the sacred world tree of the Asgardians, showed signs of decay as its branches began to wither. A dark age had descended, and the shadows of impending conflicts darkened the world. In the days of decline, Odin, the Allfather, turned to the head of Mimir, whom he carefully preserved in a box, seeking advice. After tapping into Mimir's wisdom, he chose to elevate a Dane into a powerful leader. When a Danish king and his barren wife made a great sacrifice during a pilgrimage to Uppsala and prayed for an heir, Odin heard their prayers. A child was bestowed upon them, and they named him Harald. From birth, Harold was remarkably attractive and surpassed all boys his age in strength and skill. After the tragic death of his parents, concern grew among his followers that conspirators could threaten the young king. They performed a powerful ritual to protect him and requested that iron could never harm him. Impressed by their dedication, Odin granted Harold this special invulnerability. Instead of wearing heavy armor, Harold donned a magnificent purple cloak and led his army. A gold-embroidered band held back his hair, and his mere presence dulled the weapons of his enemies. However, there was a weakness in Harold's seemingly invincible armor. While iron couldn't harm him, he was vulnerable to wood. A tale from his youth tells of Harold disguised as a beggar, sneaking into the wedding of the man who had murdered his father. In the ensuing confrontation, the groom struck Harald with a wooden cudgel, knocking out two of his teeth. To everyone's amazement, two new molars quickly grew in their place. This incident, along with his numerous campaigns, earned him the name Battle Tooth. Despite his martial feats, Harald was known as a generous and honorable ruler. When he once came to the aid of a small king in distress, betrayed by his own sister, Harald refused all gifts after victory. He stated that the glory of the triumph would enhance his reputation more than enough. His military campaigns also pitted him against three younger Swedish king brothers who challenged the Danish king. Harold's ambition and courage knew no bounds, and he shied away from no challenge. Uncertain about the outcome of the impending war, Harold sought a strategy. As he contemplated the casting of lots, an impressively large, one-eyed man in a blue cloak approached him. He introduced himself as Odin and offered valuable advice for the battle. He should arrange his warriors into three wedge formations, with the middle wedge being larger than the other two. This arrangement would remind the fighters of three adjacent boars. With Odin's counsel and this new battle formation, Harald succeeded in defeating two of the royal brothers. Although he couldn't defeat the third brother, he managed to win him over as an ally. The two formed a blood brotherhood, and the Swedish king married Harold's sister. Warriors from many lands came to join Harold's army. He set strict rules for them. None of his warriors were allowed to show fear in battle, neither through sounds nor other signs. A warrior who blinked his eyes when struck 
would be immediately banished from the warrior band. Harold expected absolute bravery and determination from his men. He also decreed that wounded warriors, despite their pain, could not groan. They had to wait 24 hours before tending to their bleeding wounds. These rules demonstrated his expectations for the bravery and endurance of his men. Battletooth expanded his realm by defeating neighboring peoples and imposing tribute upon them. His fame continued to grow when he triumphed in Britain. Next, he turned his attention to the Slavs. Instead of killing their brave leaders, Harold had them bound and incorporated into his retinue, a gesture that showcased both his power and generosity. When Ubo, the leader of the Frisians, invaded Jutland and killed farmers there, Harold confronted him. Although Ubo fought bravely, Harold couldn't defeat him with weapons. Instead, he had Ubo captured and bound. Rather than punishing him, Harold gave him one of his sisters in marriage and welcomed him into his retinue. Ubo repaid with unwavering loyalty to Harold, demonstrating their special bond. It was clear that Harold's ability to turn enemies into allies was a key to his successful rule. Harold, after uniting his realm and either conquering or keeping the surrounding territories in check, created an impressive military force that ensured five decades of peace. During his reign, no neighboring king dared to start a war, and thanks to his powerful fleet, peace also prevailed on the seas. Thanks to this long peace, the land experienced a period of prosperity. Farmers lived well, trade ships came to the ports, and impressive places of worship for the gods were built. But then came a turning point. The Swedish king, with whom Harold had formed a blood brotherhood, and to whom he had given his sister in marriage, passed away. Their common son, Ring, ascended the throne. Harold, who was close to his nephew, shared all his plans and adventures with him. The confidential messages between the two were conveyed by Harold's most trusted confidant, Bruno, with whom he had grown up since childhood. This bond of intimacy and mutual respect between Harold and Ring was a sign of the strength and unity of their two kingdoms. Harold, who had become frail and blind with age, did not want to die in his bed. Such an end would have been shameful for him. Odin, the god of war and wisdom, prepared a magnificent reception in Valhalla, the warrior's heaven, for his brave warrior. Perhaps Odin found the long period of peace too boring or had other plans for the two kings. One day, Harold's loyal messenger Bruno drowned while trying to cross a river from Denmark to Sweden during heavy rains, turning it into a raging torrent. Odin took advantage of this opportunity, secretly assuming Bruno's form and fabricating messages between Harold and Ring. Through his deception, he sowed mistrust and envy, insulting their honor so much that war became inevitable. Odin, always seeking new conflict, proposed a reconciliation meeting. However, instead of fostering peace, this only led to Harold and Ring ending their friendship and preparing for a mighty war that would last for seven years. Both kings assembled their armies, and Odin urged them to gather the greatest and most powerful force to triumph in the impending battle. Harald was not only driven by hatred for Ring as he gathered troops. His true goal was to march with a massive army to Valhalla, seeking eternal glory there. The upcoming battle became a legend as warriors from all lands flocked to participate in this epic clash. They aimed to excel in the greatest battle ever fought and gain fame. As the Braval battle drew closer, a scout from Ring's side observed Harold's vast army approaching Sweden. He reported to his king that at sunrise he had encountered the front part of the enemy forces, and by sunset he had encountered the rear. This was a testimony to the immense size of Harold's forces. The numerous sails of the Danish fleet covered the sky to the point where it could hardly be seen. The sound between Zealand and Sweden was so filled with boats that one could have walked across it like a bridge from one shore to the other. It was clear that this would be no ordinary battle, but a conflict that would go down in history. Webjorg from Schleswig, a brave woman, 
was the first of the three female commanders to lead for Harold into battle. She had chosen to defy the traditional life of a woman and had become a respected warrior instead. Wismar, the second female commander, was known for her strictness and combat experience. The third, Hetta, was equally fearless and led her army in full armor. It was impressive how even the most prominent male leaders obeyed the orders of these courageous female commanders. Harold Battletooth, recognizing the significance of these women, dispatched a Saxon leader who fought on the side of the Danes to ring. His task was to mark out the battlefield, as was customary at the time. This was done using hazel branches, which served as boundary markers to define the positions of the warring armies. This ritual was a sign of respect and honor between the warring parties and served to ensure an orderly course of the battle. It was a moment of pause before the inevitable chaos of war. Tension on the battlefield was palpable. Ring, confident due to the number and impressive fighters in his ranks, still had to restrain his troops' impatience. He wanted to ensure that Harold's armies were fully assembled and in orderly formation before the battle began. Among Ring's fighters were some of the most renowned warriors of the time, whose names and nicknames reflected their special abilities or characteristics. Rusla, a famous shield maiden, was also one of the leaders in Ring's army. Ring's impressive fleet of 2,500 ships was spread across the sea, and their countless sails presented a breathtaking sight. It was clear that Ring was confident of defeating the now blind Harold. However, despite his infirmities and blindness, Harold was not ready to concede defeat. In a chariot driven by his loyal companion Bruno, he gave instructions for the deployment of his troops. He relied on his experience and the loyalty of his warriors and was determined to march into battle with dignity and valor. Hedda commanded the right flank, while Wismar acted as the king's banner bearer. A signal horn announced the start of the battle, and the warriors' shouts echoed across the battlefield. Arrows flew through the air so densely that they looked like a snowstorm. The berserkers, known for their ferocity, wielded fiery hardened clubs and tore through the enemy lines. The sound of clashing swords reverberated, and the ground vibrated. Slingers launched their projectiles, and spears flew, their mass darkening the sun. The cacophony of weapons was so loud that even the trees seemed to tremble. Steam rose from the wounds of the fighters, drifting into the sky like mist. The blood spilled, dyed the streams red. The atmosphere was so intense that it seemed as if the earth and the sky were touching, as if the moon were falling from its orbit. The warriors fought with such fury and determination as if it were the final battle between the gods and the enemies of the world at the end of days. Harold's troops pushed the Suedas back and gained the upper hand in the battle. The female warriors displayed remarkable skills in the fight for King Harold. Webjorg, an impressive warrior, cleaved an opponent at the chin, even though he tried to protect his chin with his beard. Wismar, marching forward with Harold's banner, fought bravely until strong hand struck off her right hand. Ubo the Frisian showed extraordinary courage and strength. His arms were bloodied from the intense battle, but he continued to lead his troops against the Swedes until he was finally pierced by 140 arrows and fell. Bruno, Harold's loyal companion, described the events on the battlefield to him. Harold, despite being blind and aged, rallied and reached for his two trusted swords. He ordered Bruno to drive the chariot forward and managed to cut down many opponents. When he asked Bruno about the formation of the enemy army and received the answer, in the boar's formation, Harold exclaimed, Odin revealed that only to me. A sudden silence from Bruno left Harold fearing that something was amiss. Instead of asking Odin for victory, Harold accepted the inevitable. He requested that all his soldiers be taken to Valhalla and that all the fallen be dedicated to his god. Exhausted, Harold threw away his swords and reached for his wooden club. But suddenly, a figure resembling Bruno rushed towards him. This figure snatched Harold's club and struck him down with it. After this deed, the Bruno-like figure disappeared without a trace. When Ring learned of the great king's death, 
he immediately ordered the battle to cease. Ring's men searched the battlefield for Harold's body. This search took many hours because around Harold's chariot lay countless dead warriors, some up to the chariot's axle. Ring's army lost 12,000 of its finest warriors, while Harold's army lost 30,000 of its elite. The number of fallen foot soldiers was not recorded. In recognition of Harold's fame and honor, Ring placed gold-embroidered blankets on his own horse and hitched it to Harold's chariot. May he enter Valhalla, he exclaimed, and ordered a great funeral pyre to be built. He asked the Danes to bring Harold's gold-adorned ship to the pyre. As Harold Battletooth's body burned in the flames, Ring, out of respect and honor for his uncle, tossed precious weapons and other treasures into the fire. Odin welcomed Harold Battletooth and the many fallen warriors from both armies into Valhalla on that day. It was a host unlike any other day in Valhalla's history. Odin believed he was now well prepared for the impending battle against the enemies of the world.